Welcome to this brief introduction to the worms we call nematodes, or nematodes if you prefer that pronunciation. My name is Steve Nadler, and I'm professor and chair of the Department of Entomology and Nematology, the department on campus that studies insects and worms. And in the photo here, I'm in the Southern California desert collecting soil for nematodes. So that makes me a card-carrying nematologist, and uh, so I'm pretty excited to have this chance to tell you more about the worms that I study. So why should you want to know more about the nematodes? Well, first of all, don't take my word for why it's important. I'm pretty biased. But the famous naturalist E.O. Wilson, who studies ants, notes that 80% of the individual animals living on the Earth are nematodes. They are clearly important to the Earth's ecosystems, even if we don't fully understand all the things that they do. And as parasites, they affect human health, the health of other animals, and reduce our food production. So they're clearly important in that respect. So how many of you have seen a nematode? My guess is not too many of you. And that's because most species of nematodes are microscopic, with the exception being some of the large animal parasites. Some general features of nematodes include a cylindrical shape, that is their body is shaped like a cylinder, and they are round in cross-section, and that's what's illustrated in the color photo on the bottom left. So imagine that you bisect that nematode's body and look at it sort of face on. You see that round shape, and that's what gives nematodes their common name, roundworm. Now, nematodes molt like many other invertebrate animals, such as insects. This diagram shows the general life history of a nematode. There's the egg, four juvenile stages, plus the adult stage. So when a juvenile stage hatches from the egg, it will start feeding, it will grow, and then it will become quiescent and undergo molting, where the outer layer of the nematode is shed. And then that pattern repeats. So we have a first stage juvenile, a second stage juvenile, a third stage, a fourth stage, and then a molt to the adult stage. Now, most nematodes have separate sexes. That is, there's a male and a female life history stage. So how common are nematodes in the environment? Well, they can be found just about everywhere, even blowing in the wind in a dried and arrested state called anhydrobiosis. But they are most abundant in soils and sediments, with the record being ocean sediments, with more than 100 million individuals per square meter. Even in relatively depauperate soils like a desert, there can be three quarters of a million nematodes per square meter. So truly a remarkable number of nematodes. So how do we go about collecting nematodes from soil and sediments to observe them? One way is something we call a Behrman funnel. In that funnel, the soil is suspended in water, and the live nematodes move and end up sinking in the stem of the funnel. We can then take off that water, put the sample under a stereo microscope, and observe the nematodes, which will be alive and moving, as hopefully you can see in this video clip. Then we can take these nematodes, remove them individually using specialized methods, and use them for further study. So the reason that most people don't know about nematode species are because of their small size, with most being less than two millimeters long as adults. So without a microscope, you can't easily see them. The exception are certain ones that are parasites of animals. For example, one type of intestinal roundworm from dogs and cats is about six centimeters in length, so easily seen if they end up being excreted by the dog. And the largest nematode we know of is a parasite of whales and is about nine meters in length. So where do you find nematode species in nature? The greatest estimated species diversity of nematodes is marine, in the sediments. 
This is followed by terrestrial soil and freshwater nematodes, which we estimate make up about 25% of all nematode species. And parasites, both of plants and animals, make up an estimated 25% of nematodes as well. So then, what do nematodes feed on? How do they make their living, so to speak? One way is to feed on primary producers, such as plants. Here we see two types of plant parasitic nematodes feeding on roots. On the left, you see endoparasites feeding within the roots of plants, whereas ectoparasites move around on the outside of roots, feeding on plant tissues using a stylet, which is seen in the middle photo and is like a small needle that is inserted into the tissues to withdraw materials to feed on. Plant nematodes can cause various kinds of damage, but the most common type is damage to the roots of plants. On the left photo, you can see the difference in root size between uninfected versus infected grape plants. On the right is the damage caused by the aptly named root knot nematode. Root damage reduces transport of water and nutrients to the plant, and this reduces yields in cultivated crops. The most common way nematodes make a living is by feeding on bacteria and other small microscopic life in sediments like soil. Such nematode species have characteristic mouths and other structures that help them ingest bacteria. In the photo on the right, you can see bacteria in the mouth of this nematode. We call these nematodes microbivores. By now, you can also tell that we can tell much about what a nematode feeds on by looking at its mouth parts. Fungi are common in soils and sediments too, and so it's not surprising that there are nematodes that specialize in feeding on fungi. These nematodes also use a stylet to obtain nutrients from fungal hyphae. Nematodes can also be predators, specialized for feeding on other small animals. This nematode has a specialized mouth with sharp teeth that it uses to shred prey when they are ingested. It also feeds on other nematode species in the environment. It brings nematodes into its body for digestion similar to how a snake ingests its prey. There are also a large number of nematode species that get their nutrition from feeding within another animal as a parasite. These nematodes that are shown here are hookworms that feed on blood they obtain while living in the intestine of their host. Another type of parasite you might be familiar with if you have a dog is the dog heartworm. It is transmitted to dogs by certain mosquitoes, and that's why you give your dog a monthly medication to prevent the juvenile parasite from developing within your dog. So how many species of nematodes are there? 27,000 species have been described by scientists, and most of these are parasites of animals or plants because we want to know more about what is causing damage to our crops and to our animals both companion animals and production animals. But most species of nematodes have never been described, and we find them all the time in the samples that we take. For example, this photograph shows the head ends of some nematodes that we study in my lab. And species in this group can be found in soils everywhere, including right here in Davis. How does described nematode diversity compare to other groups of organisms? There are many more described species of nematodes than there are of mammals, but many fewer than insects. How many species of nematodes are there that have not been described? Well, as I've told you, scientists really just don't know. Some scientists have tried to make educated guesses, but the truth is that there are some things that we just don't have good answers for yet, and this is one of them. More than a century ago, the first nematologist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture noted this particular problem about nematode diversity. That compared to most other organisms, we'd certainly know less about the diversity of nematodes. 
This is unfortunate because we know that nematodes are key to processes that maintain healthy soil, and we all depend on soils for the growth of our food. We still have much to learn about nematodes. So more than 100 years later, what can we do to help discover more about nematode biodiversity? We can certainly use new technology, and we are, such as DNA sequencing, but there's more to it than that. It's not enough to simply use molecular tools to find undescribed nematode species. Scientists have to link the molecular data to the morphology of adult nematodes and then describe using classic techniques these new species. This is a very labor intensive task that requires the specialized training that only nematologists have. But one thing I think should be very clear to you, it's a nematode world out there and we need to understand more about what these microscopic animals are doing in our environment. Thank you very much for listening.